Chapter One of Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amanda Friday. Molly of the Movies by Kenneth McGaffey. Chapter One First Reel. Grundy Center, Iowa, March 5. Dear Clara Bell, I guess by this time you have seen in the weekly that I have won the prize as the most beautiful girl in Dubuque County. It came as an awful surprise to me. I sent in my photograph, but you could have knocked me flat with a feather when I found that I was the winner. I didn't know I was so swell. If I had known I was to have won, I would have had a good photograph taken that looked like me. As it was, Hicks jabbed my head into one of those iron wishbone things, and I nearly choked to death. The first thing I knew about winning the prize was when someone rushed into the parlor of Martha Williams' home, where us members of the Apollo Dramatic Club were rehearsing, the Lady of Lions, and right in the middle of my big scene, congratulated me. It certainly was some surprise to certain persons you and I know, who think they are beautiful to gaze upon. I guess you know who I mean, Clara Bell. There are a lot of our most fashionable set, girls that thought red hair was horrible, that have just chewed their fingernails down to the quick since they heard. My picture is to be in one of the Chicago papers, Sunday, as Dubuque County's fairest flower. Oh, I forgot to tell you what the grand prize is. I have three choices, a life subscription to the weekly, a trip to Chicago, or ten dollars cash. Now I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, and I don't want you to breathe a word of it to a soul. I am going to be a moving picture actress, and act out before the camera. I saw an advertisement in the paper the other day, How to Be a Mary Pickford in Ten Lessons for Ten Dollars, and I'm going to send the ten I won as the prize, and take the course. I have sold tickets now at this old bijou dream for four months, and I'm getting so I tear off a strip of whatever I have in my hand every time I see a dime. And would you believe it, my neck is so stiff from trying to watch Charlie Chaplin and sell tickets at the same time, I have to rub it with liniment every night. Mr. Gottlieb told me just yesterday, between the two real Morris Costello and the one real Helen Holmes, that I would make a grand movie actress. Although, through jealousy, I only get maid parts with the Apollo Dramatic Club. Both father and mother say I am a grand actress, and Uncle Will calls me his little Sarah Bernhardt. I stood on my head one night over at Mary Wilson's and practiced turning cartwheels at the YMCA gym, and after I rehearse a while, jumping off of bridges, and stopping runaway horses, and take this ten dollars worth of Mary Pickford, I am going out to California and accept an engagement. Of course, I get good money in the business end of the moving pictures, six dollars every week, no matter what comes in. But my soul yearns for the artistic. Mr. Gottlieb can just sell his own tickets. Oh, Clara Bell, won't it be just grand to be out there in California, where all the moving picture actors and actresses live, and hobnob with them, and be their equal? I can hardly wait for my first lesson. I have enough money saved for my salary, selling tickets at this here old film bazaar, to take me to California, and you bet I will have some more saved up before I leave. Of course, I don't expect to be a five-reel feature at first. I think I will have to start as a one-reel comic, and work my way up, reel by reel. You know that I have been seeing so many pictures since I've been working here, that even every one of the passed by the National Board of Censors seems to me like a dear friend, even though the censors do cut out the best parts. Mr. Gottlieb tells me it is no cinch being a movie picture actress, and I can see that, but I am strong and willing. Didn't I work for a month in the Palace Hotel dining room, and goodness knows you have to be strong to lug in what those drummers order, and willing to work for nothing except fresh remarks. They tell me that Mary Pickford gets $4,000 a week. I know I am going to be all right, but until I am able to show the directors how good I am, I am willing to take only a thousand a week, and pay my own streetcar fare to and from the studio. We'll write and tell you all about the lessons, but must close now, because here comes a dime. Love, Molly. In route, April 6. Dear Clara Bell, Well, here I am bound for California, and believe me, I had an awful time getting started. In the first place, I certainly had my troubles getting the ten dollars out of the weekly. They told me how much good a life subscription to the paper would have done, and when I wouldn't take that, they wanted to give me a round-trip ticket to Chicago, on some excursion, but me for the boundless West. When I finally got the ten, mostly in small change, I sent right away to the moving picture school man, 
and got my whole Mary Pickford course in one shipment, collect. The lessons are hard, but certainly complete. I feel that they have done me a world of good, even if they did nearly kill me. The first thing the lessons taught was to get accustomed to act before the camera. Any camera would do, the book said, so I took Brother George's brownie. Then the book said not to look into the lens while acting. You could not act and do that, Clarabelle, because you have to peek into a little hole to see the lens, and you couldn't move your arms or nothing. There was a long chapter telling how to be familiar with any role, from a street waif to the pampered daughter of wealthy parents. You know what a chance I had rehearsing with Pa as a millionaire parent when he shucks his shoes and coat as soon as he strikes the house after work. I even had to go over to Cousin Esther's to rehearse my work girl scenes, because Mother has a weak heart, and if she saw me do anything around the house, the shock might injure her for life. Another lesson taught me how to rehearse for death-defying stunts. That's where I used all the arnica, and I'm sure lucky to be here to tell the tale. When I got up after leaping from that rapidly moving milk wagon, I nearly decided to forsake my artistic career and go back to work. There was nothing nowhere in the lessons about using arnica. But I guess I did not step out of the character by using it, as I was, according to the book, supposed to be carried to a hospital, and there nursed back to life, by a dashing young doctor, with an automobile, and a mission. Finally, I finished all my lessons, and sent a quarter more to the professor, and got a handsome diploma, tied with blue ribbon. The letter with it said all that I had to do was to show it to any picture director, and I would know right where I belonged. When I had enough money saved up for my ticket to California, and some left over, I just up and told the folks that fame was waiting me, and left them flat. The whole town was down, as usual, to see number six hesitate. Mother cried a little. I kissed the total population of Grundy Center goodbye. Bill, the new conductor, waved his hand, and I was off to pastures new. Of course, Grundy Center is an up-to-date burg, as everybody knows, but so that I would not be taken for any farmer's bride or boarding school miss, I sent right to Chicago, and got the latest Paris creation from Sears Roebuck. You won't believe me when I tell you that the outfit, including the hat, of course, cost me $15.85, without express charges. My dear, it is a silk sand-colored suit, very full skirt, thank heavens, and a broad crimson belt. The hat matches the belt, and I wore black low shoes and red silk stockings. The only way that I can tell you how it becomes me is to simply say that everyone turned to look as I walked down the aisle of the train. I am traveling right in the sleeping car all the way. After you go to bed, they take the stairs out. This paper I am writing on is free. Father bought me the Pullman ticket as a birthday present, so all I had to do was to pay my railway fare. I am a regular traveler by now, and sit right out on the observation platform, and eat the lunch Mother put up for me. Fried chicken and everything. They have a cafe on the train, but I only go in there for breakfast. And even then, you have to buy more than a quarter's worth, whether you can eat it or not. I met a couple of nice traveling gentlemen on the train, Nothing like the fresh drummers that sit with their feet up on the Palace Hotel porch railing and sigh for the gay life of Dubuque. They were real kind to me and pointed out all the points of interest, and when I told them I was going to be a movie star, one said he'd get more fun out of seeing me act than Blanche Sweet. We are traveling through a part of California now and will be in Los Angeles a couple of hours, so I will close and write you as soon as I get settled. We are going through the orange groves now, and the snow must be all gone, as I haven't seen none under the trees. Love, Molly. End of chapter 1